The biggest push yet to re-establish government control over areas seized by rebel fighters in Iraq. But is Prime Minister Nur al-Maliki calling the shots on a bigger battlefield? And how is that shaping US policy and the reaction? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Now, Iraqi Prime Minister Nur al-Maliki is fighting back against a Sunni-led rebellion and against those who would see him replaced. And on both fronts, he appears to be enjoying some success. Government forces have mounted their biggest push yet to regain ground lost to fighters from the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, or ISIL, as well as some of the tribes. And Maliki's determination to crush his foes is influencing the attitudes of regional and international players who are bound to the crisis. Maliki has resisted encouragement from the U.S. and within his own ranks to form a more inclusive national unity government. Yet, the U.S. remains committed to stemming the crises in Iraq and Syria, conflicts being viewed increasingly as a single fight. Well, the U.S. has sent about 300 military advisers to Iraq and the Pentagon has confirmed it has dispatched armed aerial drones in case those advisers need protection. Pentagon officials also say they're rushing through the delivery of hundreds of hellfire missiles to the Iraqi military. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has also announced $500 million in arms and training for Syria's opposition. It's part of a $1.5 billion commitment to U.S. interests in the region. Speaking in Saudi Arabia, Kerry said the Syrian opposition had an important role to play in Iraq. Uh, we have even more to talk about in terms of the moderate opposition in Syria, which has the ability to be a very important uh, player in pushing back against ISIL's presence, as they have been, not just in uh, Syria, but also in Iraq. Now, President Barack Obama had earlier set conditions for further U.S. involvement in Iraq. Any action that we may take to provide assistance to Iraqi security forces has to be joined by a serious and sincere effort by Iraq's leaders to set aside sectarian differences, to promote stability and account for the legitimate interests of all of Iraq's communities, and to continue to build the capacity of an effective security force. Uh, we can't do it for them. And in the absence of this type of political effort, Short-term military action, uh, including any assistance we might provide, won't succeed. Well, the U.S. now finds itself facing something of a dilemma, funding a war against President Bashar al-Assad in Syria, but aligned to him in the fight against the ISIL. So plenty to talk about with our guests. Let's uh, introduce them now. Joining me here in the studio is Ayad Al-Qazaz, a professor at California State University and a specialist in Arab culture and politics. Joining us from London is Saad Jawad, an Iraqi pol political scientist at the London School of Economics Middle East Center. And in Washington, D.C., we have Mark Kimmett, a former U.S. State Department official and retired Brigadier General. Good to have you with us. If we could start perhaps first here in the studio. Ayad, what do you see as the U.S. goal in Iraq? Do you see it as an attempt to form a broader government, more representative of Sunnis without al-Maliki, a strategy that could win? I really don't think so. The Why US, not? That seems to be what they've been saying. Uh, the, the, they always said that. They've been saying that since they invaded and destroyed the country of Iraq. They said that four years ago when they formed the second government under the Maliki, and they are saying it again. All what they are interested to have a cosmetic operation. Now the tension went out of control, and they tried to recontrol it. And this is why they are rushing to support in Maliki. They already sent 300. That is what they announced. But God knows how many went secretly, which we don't know anything about them. But are they rushing? They've put set conditions, haven't they? Well, the US, they are haven't they learned by now? I don't perhaps? think so. Because their objective from the very beginning to keep the tension going in that area.
by encouraging sectarian and ethnic tendency. When is the last time President Bush identified the Iraqi as Arabs, as a Muslim? He always, uh, always... President Obama, you mean? No, no, Bush. Right. And now all the other, even Bush himself. He never say the Arab of Iraq. He never say the Muslim of Iraq. He always identify them in a sectarian tendency. So from the very, very beginning, we encourage sectarian tendency. We did that in the council. We did that in the first government, the second government. And I'm sure there's going to be the third All government. Right. Let's too. bring Mark Kimmett into the discussion. That, that is a sentiment you often hear here in the Middle East that U.S. policies are more divisive. Uh, have things changed this time round in the way that the U United States is approaching the current crisis in Iraq? Well, well, first of all, I don't even know how to begin to respond to those delusional comments. Uh, the fact is the United States believes in a unitary Iraq representative of all its people. Uh, there is no grand conspiracy. I returned from Iraq yesterday. I know exactly how many uh, U.S. advisors are there. There are no grand numbers of secret forces there. And we can't have a discussion about this if we're going to be talking in such preposterous language. Let's, let's shift the discussion to then what you see the American policy to be, one would assume, a more united representative Iraq, correct, yep. Mark? No, I think that's right. What the United States would like to do is facilitate and enable, but not control who's in power inside of Iraq. The United States firmly believes that the elected government is the representative of the people of Iraq. We would like to see okay. an elected is government that, working, that is though? more what, inclusive what of all. does the United States have to influence the formation of this next government, shall we say, or some conditions to the U.S. getting more militarily involved, which seems to be what the Iraqi prime minister has been asking yeah. for? Well, that's right. I think the right word that you used, Sammy, is conditional. The United States is prepared to offer support to the elected government of Iraq, but in turn would like to see a more inclusive government, one that is, does not uh, break down along sectarian lines. Uh, we want to encourage a government that represents all of the people, not just some of the sects, and that's what we are conditioning our support upon. May I remind Mark that four years ago, President Obama said exactly the same thing which you said. We need inclusive government. What happened yeah. since four years ago? All right, That's let's give Mark exactly a, the same word. Let's give an we opportunity. Re repeating it again and again and again with no result. All right, Mark, very briefly. Well, I think that's exactly what the United States would like to see. But as President Obama said, uh, we can't do it for the people of Iraq. The parliament inside of Iraq, which is representative of all the parties and all the sects, has done an abysmal job holding Prime Minister Maliki to account. But you don't want the Americans to come back in and start controlling your government. You don't want the government, the Americans to come back in and occupy the nation again. So the Iraqis have got to take responsibility for their own politics. And that's what the U.S. can help with. But it can't do the work for the Iraqis right, themselves. Perhaps this is I a good think point. Let, let us, since we're on the point of talking about the Iraqi uh, parliament and its moves, well, uh, let us remind people that, of course, this is all playing out as Iraq's parliament right now is trying to discuss uh, how it's going to put together the next uh, government. The first session is supposed to be held on Tuesday to start the process of electing a prime minister and forming that government. But as Zainal Khuda reports from Erbil in Iraq's Kurdistan region, it's not expected to be an easy task. He may be miles away from the battleground, but in his own way, Sheikh Ali Hatem al Suleiman continues to wage war against his longtime enemy, Prime Minister Nouri al Maliki. From a hotel in the Kurdish region, this Sunni tribal leader is sending a clear message. There can be no political reconciliation in Iraq until Maliki leaves power, and there can be no peace unless an interim salvation government takes control to carry out reforms. <laughs> We inform Sunni politicians, in fact, we warned them not to attend the parliament meeting on July 1st or else they will be considered traitors. If they do, they would be giving legitimacy to Maliki and they would be accepting the killing of Sunnis by Maliki's militias. A national salvation government, however, has been dismissed by Maliki. Instead, he called for the recently elected parliament to meet on July 1 to start the process of forming a government. A more inclusive government has been a key demand of the United States. States, and it wants it in place before assisting the Iraqi government face what it called the militant threat. 
Washington is in a difficult position. The Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant may be leading the fight against the Shia-led government, but other Sunni groups are also taking part, and Iraq Sunnis support the rebellion. The U.S. cannot be seen as taking sides in what is being described as a Sunni-Shia war. But it may be too late. Sheikh Ali Hatem Suleiman once cooperated with the U.S. to fight al-Qaeda in Iraq. Years later, he is refusing to fight the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant until the U.S. reviews its policies. It needs to review its support to this government. Some of their statements are unacceptable, like when they say they will support the Iraqi army. What army? There is no army in Iraq. They are Maliki's Iranian-backed sectarian militias. They are the real threat to Iraq. This conflict has been in the making for years. Forming a government may not be enough to end the rebellion. After all, it is not the politicians, but those who hold the arms on both sides of the divide who need to make peace if Iraq as a nation state is to survive. Senator Al Jazeera, Erbil. All right, so a lot of maneuvering going on. Saad Jawad in London. One of the things that has come up here, obviously, is uh, perhaps Russian planes being sent to help al-Maliki, uh, perhaps even al-Maliki managing to get some military support uh, from Iran, uh, planes being returned to Iraq from Iran. All of this, is this basically a situation where Maliki is trying to maneuver so he can get the military support he needs without having to give in to some of the demands, U.S. demands and others, for him to step down? Well, to, to start with, I would just like to comment on one of what the phrases your, your guest from the Washington said. Uh, he said that the Americans are not ready to go into Iraq to solve the problem for the Iraqis. And they were... I, I cannot understand how did they have the right to go into Iraq in 2003, destroy the country, dissolve the army, put the country in chaos and leave it like that. Yet when the country was in the country is in need uh, of their support, they are refraining from doing that. Is that because they have done the job and that's all? They have destroyed the country, uh, the country, and that that is what they wanted. The second thing is, I cannot understand how a government, after 11 years, or how assistance and training of 11 years could not create a real Iraqi army. And now the Americans are speaking about speeding the, the training and speeding the shipment of arms. Would that create a real army? This is not an army. It is called the National Guards. It's a collection of militias from different parties. And that's how they were fa they, they were treating the people, sectarian, inhumanate. OK, in but son, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, this seems Sorry. to be the strategy which, which the U.S. Is, is trying to put some conditions to, though, doesn't it? It's saying, we'll, we'll give you more weapons and arms if you, come, well, no. if you perhaps put yes. together a better functioning government that's more representative. Mr. al-Maliki is still insisting on staying in, in staying in power. Iran is supporting him, or supporting his party at last, uh, at least, sorry. And there are other groups inside Iraq. They want Mr. al-Maliki. In my view, Mr. al-Maliki is the problem. If he doesn't leave the government, if he doesn't step down, it will be difficult to solve any problem. But the problem is, or the bigger problem is, all the nominations, apart from al-Maliki, do not differ a little bit than Mr. al-Maliki. They are from the same sectarian parties. They have some tarnished reputation. So they, have, they have very, very, very bad history uh, working as minister or what have you. So I don't think that they, the, problem, uh, the problem is being saved in the right way or okay. solved in All the right, right Let me way. bring the discussion Sorry. back to the studio uh, here. Yeah. Regardless of, let, let's take the scenario in which al-Maliki leaves. Is there anybody that you can see on the landscape who could come to the helm of affairs in the Prime Minister's office and be acceptable to the broader Sunni tribes and populations of Iraq? Uh, let me make one or two or three comments. Uh, I'm making them very short. Number one, the problem is not the Maliki. The problem is the system. As Dr. Saad said, you can replace the Maliki with somebody else. But that somebody else has the same problem. So, until so, so what are you saying, that the conflict is going to go on regardless The conflict is going on because they already planted the seed. So uh, will the, do you think the U.S. should get involved if that is the ah, case? Ah, that's a that's very good question. Way? The U.S. is part of the problem. They created the problem okay, and they are part we, of the problem. Let me rephrase the let question. Me should the U.S. Comment. get more involved militarily? No. 
It shouldn't. No. To, to my own feeling that all the outsiders should stop interfering in Iraq and let the Iraqi handle themselves. Won't the they, state collapse? Well, the state will not collapse. Iraqi had a long history from Hammurabi and before Hammurabi to the present day. Once upon a time, Baghdad was the center of culture, the center of civilization. Everybody talk about the Arab contribution, the Muslim contribution. So there are a lot of qualified people. Somebody will emerge. I cannot name somebody to you, but somebody will emerge. But the Maliki or his replacement is not going to solve the problem. The problem, the outside interference, whether it's the U.S., whether it's Saudi Arabia, or whether Iran or somebody else. So what, who has the solution then? Well, what is the, the solution, solution you the Iraqi. The system is the problem. What should change in this? The system? Iraqi will provide the solution. I have big faith in the Iraqi people. Do you have an idea what the solution is? Though? The solution, number one, we stop the interference. Number two, we come up with a government, technical government, based on a qualification, not on a sectarian qualification, not because you are Sunni, not because you are Shi'i. That is very, very important. This is the seed with the U.S. planted in Iraq. Make it, they Lebanese Iraqi politics, and that's what they want. Let them fight with each other, and we are the people. We can control them behind the scene, and that's what they did. The conflict now is out of control. They want to recontrol it by providing cosmetic operation. This idea of insisting that all Iraqi components will be part of the government, this is not new. This is an old song. They sang it for the last 13 years or 12 years. Okay. So this is not the solution. All right, Mark Kimmett, uh, what do you think of the idea that perhaps the U.S. military involvement, how, whatever shape it takes, is going to be counterproductive? There really is no role, for, a positive role, for the U.S. to play here because, as Mr. Ayad is pointing out, any change will simply be cosmetic. The problem, the underlying tension and problem that exists right now in Iraq is not going to go away whether you have a Maliki or someone else at the helm of affairs. No, I think that's right. And that's why I believe President Obama is so reluctant to put American troops in the ground. Uh, he's reluctant because he understands that as soon as you put Americans on the ground, then they become uh, the lightning rod around which everybody can blame the problems. That's why the numbers are very limited. They're only there at the request of the government, a government and a parliament that represents all the people inside of Iraq. Uh, this notion that somehow the United States planted the seeds for this violence. In fact, you've had less American interference inside of Iraq since the departure of troops in 2011 uh, than we've had in the last 10 years. And one could only suggest that the lack of American involvement uh, has been accompanied by an increase in the violence and the inability of the government to come together. So, yes, America wants to help. But America does not want to introduce itself, reintroduce itself into Iraq, does not want to play a major role, would be more than delighted if the Iraqis could take care of this problem themselves. But, but it's only because on, the Iraqis Mark, themselves you, you won't boots, take responsibility. Boots on the ground may be one thing. What about aerial strikes? What about reports that drones are already being deployed there? I mean, for, to, to what extent do you really think yep. it's practical that... Washington will resist all temptation to be involved in any form militarily if we do see ISIL getting stronger, Sunni uh, tribes getting stronger, and the Iraqi state, you know, at the point of collapse. Well, number one, the, the drones that are being provided, by and large, are intelligence drones. They are unarmed drones that are being used to provide the government of Iraq with the intelligence that they so desperately need to track and to locate the ISIL elements. Will it end there, Number though? Number two, the armed drones, as your own package mentioned, were there for the self-protection of the advisory groups. They're not going to be used in an overall drone campaign as we've seen in Pakistan. So any notion that the drones are being used for anything other than intelligence collection and force protection at this point is just incorrect. Well, the latest news about the drone, they bombed Mosul by the drone. This is what I heard today. Well, that's, sure, that's what you heard, but that's false. Well, we'll, we'll find out. I can categorically what, reject that. What, what, what we'll about in out. Syria? Because that seems to be now the way that the United States is viewing this as, as sort of one front. Can it, can it resist being drawn more militarily into Syria in its uh, attempts to undermine the ISIL? Well, listen, I think that what we're seeing is more pressure being put inside of Syria, as announced by Secretary of State Kerry, that more work would be done with the Syrian moderate groups to be going against the roots and against the bases of ISIL. I would be surprised that uh, 
the United States would increase its involvement in targeting, in large measure, large groups of ISIL and turn somehow turn Iraq into a drone battlefield the way that has been done in either Yemen or Pakistan. At this point, the Iraqi security forces are back on the offensive. It's good to see the Iraqi forces challenging ISIL because it has to be the Iraqi security forces that lead and win this fight. All right, let's uh, turn to our guest in, uh, in London. The perspective from uh, one guest here is that the U.S. shouldn't get involved. From another guest that, well, the, the United States also shouldn't and probably won't get too involved militarily. Do you agree with that, Saad? Well, I think the United States is involved indirectly, if it's not by. But we're talking the more directly now. We're talking more militarily. Yeah, more militarily, they are providing the Syrian resistance or the Syrian opposition with five million dollars assistance. Is that isn't that an involvement, direct involvement, and the money will go to people who are not really ready to fight and they may sell their arms to the other Islamic groups as we have seen before. Now in Iraq they have been training the Iraqi army as they say they have been involved in establishing this new army and this is the result. I think they should they should at least claim or, or uh, at least uh, uh, say to the people that they have failed in Iraq and they have uh, they own the Iraqi people an apology and then leave the Iraqis to to solve their own problems I think the United Nations should get involved and not the United States because the United States involvement created this uh, this havoc this this chaos in the country and until this thing is 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 done by the United Nations? A, tech, a, a techno government was is established. All these sectarian parties who are rigging the the elections, who are forcing people to elect the people they wanted, who are paying money of corruption to people to elect them, should go away, and a new real election should take place. Until these right, things well, take place, that, that I think may the Iraq be problem will not be solved. Entire change of the political system may be a bit further away. Let's bring it closer to home. Uh, Mr. Ayad, whatever happens, it does look like Mr. al-Maliki wants to try and stay in power. It does look like he's trying to find any avenue of support, military support he can, whether it's from the US or Russia or allegedly even Iran. Can the rebellion by Sunnis in Iraq be crushed through military means? Uh, it's possible. You can weaken them. They don't have the same power like the so-called Iraqi army, our friend from Washington, D.C., he said he's very happy they are taking the initiative. But this is an army of sectarian army, basically made so can out... They, can they win? Can they crush? Uh, it is very possible, because guess who is supporting them, directly or indirectly? The Americans are supporting that army. The Russian directly or indirectly supporting the army. I mean, the amazing thing, we were told by the media today, Iraq received five Russian plane. How on earth they can use them immediately in war? So who's piloting this, uh, this plane? Syrian? Iranian? Russian? Or who? Part of the problem is the outside forces. Until and unless these outside forces stop interfering in Iraq, I would say the future is very dark, is very, very bad. Maliki is going to do whatever he can to stay in power. And he may succeed, by the way. If you look at what happened... But will that not sow more seeds? I mean, we've seen him stay in power through previous challenges. Yes, yes. And now we're facing a full-on Sunni rebellion, whereas you well, know, six months ago it was, it was Sunni protests. I mean, well, even if this is crushed militarily, is that the end of the story? Yeah, but remember, four years ago they opposed Maliki. They did whatever they can. And then the American and the UN get together and they agreed on the Maliki. Not the Iraqi people, the American and the Iranian agreed that the Maliki should have another chance. And I have a feeling, that's my feeling, that he is not going to be uh, the prime minister in the coming uh, period. But that doesn't solve the problem, because who is going to the place in Maliki? Is this a genuine man or another sectarian person? All right, we're going to have to leave it there because we are out of time. Let's thank our guests, Iyad uh, Al-Qazaz here in the studio in Doha, Saad Jawad in London, and Mark Kimmett in Washington, D.C. And as always, sure. we welcome your thoughts on this and any other issues you feel strongly about. You can leave your comments at facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story or go to at AJ Inside Story on Twitter. For now, it's goodbye.